Which one's the pointer? The red dot? Oh, there it is. Okay. You all know who I am, so we'll go on. Okay. Um, I guess a little about me. I, I, I'm on call from our field offices in the southern part of the state, roughly from Springfield South. I get a lot of questions from our offices when they can't answer anything dealing with forages or livestock, they tend to call me. And so I'll be, I've been on a few farms here with some of you, and uh, otherwise I'll be answering questions from other folks. But in here, basically we need to, you know, need to find out about an operation before you start making any recommendations. Number one, what's been grow what's growing there now or what's been growing there? Uh, the other speakers, Chris and several of them talk about soil tests. That's one of the first questions I ask anybody. How old are they? I've talked to folks that's like, yeah, we took a soil test and we seeded down. When was that? 20 years ago. You know, so two or three or four years. I think University of Illinois says a soil test every four years, but you need to do that. Uh, look at what's growing, what's been produced. Are you going to make hay or pasture? That makes a little difference on the species, more on fertility. The type of animals you're using, you know, the number, whether they're going to be rotated like Chris was talking about or continuous grazed, those types of things. If you use a rest period. Uh, ideally, if I can walk a pasture or a forage site with somebody, kind of see, find out what they're, you know, if it's been managed. You know, if you got mostly bluegrass and Dutch white clover, generally it's probably been overgrazed for a long time or it's only one pasture. Talk about what weeds are there, they're kind of an indicator. Uh, as Chris was talking about, broom sedge in the southern part of the state and even up in the central part of the state is starting to show up a lot which is tied into pH and fertility levels issues. Um, generally, I like to find out what kind of forages have been growing there. You know, when they planted it 20 years ago, what they plant it to? And generally, they'll be able to tell you something if they remember, maybe not if they bought the farm. But there's going to be some of that seed in the seed bank if they can start to manage and, and uh, do things a little different. Some of that might come back. Uh, sheep generally graze closer than most of our animals other than horses. And uh, horses are probably the worst spot grazers we have because they've got teeth on their upper and lower gums so they can nip it off real close. Uh, cattle, they need a little taller forage because they tend to graze that off and tear it off with their tongues. Goats are more browsers, so they're going to work on the, the forbs, the brush, the trees, whatever they, and the goat tends to have the, the sixth scent of when, a nutrition, when any forage they're eating is nutritionally at its highest, that's when they're going to graze it and seem to be more so than some of the others. And they've got a split upper lip, so if you crowd them into a multiflora rose patch or something and leave them there long enough, they'll defoliate that to a point they could probably kill it in two years. So uh, they probably like, they like autumn olive as well. So other things, uh, I've heard people talk about ryegrass and, and horses with ryegrass staggers. I've never talked to a horse owner that had ryegrass to a greater degree, so I don't know if that's really true. I've heard them talk about it over Europe. Into fight infected tall fescue, we talked about that earlier. That's where we're at and we're in the heart of it in Illinois. So it's management. As Chris was talking and Tom Sachs was sharing some of his experience and, and the booklets I've read and other things, it's something to deal with. So we have to pay attention to it. Uh, sheep, generally they like orchard grass and rye grass is probably the least on their preference list. Uh, the end of fight issues with tall fescue, you know, it'll affect sheep and goats. Uh, sheep, they can have lower conception rates and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll lose weight and things just like the beef cattle. Uh, bird's foot trefoil, less but these are the only non-bloating legumes we've got out there, so it's kind of good to have some of them depending on the site and what, uh, what other uh, soil types you're dealing with and things like that. If you use reeds, if you have a place that has reeds canary grass and if you're going to plant any reeds canary grass, we're not allowed to recommend it anymore because it's invasive, but it's out here and there's some places that's about all will survive. And I recognize that. Uh, they've got low alkaloid varieties and uh, you might look at that if you're going to plant some of it. Ryegrasses, the tetraploid varieties are what's a little more productive. And uh, the more erect plants we have, they tend to be a little less persistent and some of that kind of goes with the jointed grasses like your Timothy and smooth brome. You've got to manage them a little better to keep them in the stand. Uh, red clover has our best uh, seedling vigor of most of the seeds we deal with, most of the legumes. 
So uh, Ann Clark, she's from the University of Gulf. She says you need kind of a shotgun approach with a broader variety of species rather than just a single one. And I tend to kind of agree with that because if you got, and, and I don't mean you need to put a, a little bit of everything out there. You need to put enough seed for certain varieties in order to have enough for a stand. But rather than just one or two species, it's probably going to do you more good. Uh, in Europe, they tend to blend the earlier variety, some of the single species with the later varieties. And uh, whether it's ryegrass, orchard grass, uh, legumes are tend to going to be about the same maturity uh, when they when they grow. Uh, New Zealand and Europe, I've been told that they add nitrogen, split apply even with legumes. They think that boosts it. We haven't really done that a lot here. Usually we figure if you got enough legumes, it's going to help versus a lot of places we don't have many. So, and uh, basically the longer you can keep something growing and the longer those animals can be out here grazing, the more economical it's going to be for your operation. Like Chris was saying, 60 to 70 percent of your annual cow cost is going to be in stored feeds. What to plant? Well, it depends on how you're going to manage it. You know, if you got just a single pasture, probably Kentucky bluegrass and fescue. Bluegrass will survive the close frequent grazing and survive as long as anything. Fescue is probably the next best thing close to that. If you're going to do managed grazing, and we can look at a lot of other alternatives. And, uh, but you need to look at the specific forages suited for the site as far as your soils you're working with, your capability of nutrition, and then, like I said, consider your grazing management. We talked about the vegetative states, the things are ready. Chris showed something on this a while ago. You kind of look at a, a, uh, a middle ground here between the uh, vegetative stage and the flowering or reproductive stage. Your elongation <coughs> here is where you want to be. That's where you got the most photosynthesis and highest energy. Um, this is kind of some along some of the similar lines what Chris was talking about. You know, you want to cut this. You know, here's going to be about your ground level, so you need to leave about a three or four inch stubble height here on a lot of these plants. That way, you're not uh, you're, you're not reducing their photosynthesis ability. And again, you're cutting this off down here. That's that one or two inch level. It's going to take a lot longer for that to come back. And uh, so this this just pretty much the same thing as what Chris was explaining earlier. So I don't spend much time there. If you all can see this, it may be a little dark back here. Your root growth mirrors the top growth. And that was one of Chris's slides similarly too. So, you know, if you can keep it where it looks more like this over here, you're all right. But we cut it a lot closer. If we cut it in here at this three to four inch or four to five inch stage, in our cool season grasses and our legumes, that's where we're going to really want to stay with some of this. Uh, we talked a little bit about different temperatures. Okay, our cool season grasses, they, their optimum growth are 60 to 80 degrees. Our legumes, they're going to be just a little warmer, 70 to 90. And I got some growth charts here later. We'll show it shows some of that stuff. Our warm season grasses, whether it's the annuals that Chris was talking about, or some of our native perennials, Indian grass, switchgrass, blue, big blue stem, uh, eastern gamma grass, they're showing up here in this 80 to 90 percent or 80, 80 to 90 percent degree weather, degree weather, not percent weather. And that's what they're because you're going to get once they start to grow, you're going to get all their production here in the summer months, where our cool season's got a different growth pattern. Oh, here we are. And right here is kind of, if you have a spring calving cow, she's going to calve in March and come over here like like uh, Travis was talking. That's going to be the blue line for what her nutritional needs are going to be. Okay, here's our cool season grass curve. You can see this. And uh, here's our summer slump right here in July and August. Here's our, our warm season grass curve. This would be natives or the summers, the, the summer annuals. You know, it's going to kick in here depending on which variety in late May, early June. Once they start to grow, they're going to get you all their production until it cools off in the fall, and then they're going to pretty much be done. But we get a little bump here in the fall with the cool season grasses, so that's going to help us on that front. Uh, okay, the green line here is tall fescue. The solid red line is big blue stem and Indian grass. That works pretty well in this part of the state. You can see it's coming along in the summer down here. Eastern gamma grass and switchgrass, they come on earlier of the native warm season grasses. So they're going to kind of be a little tighter behind our, our cool season grass curve, but they're still both going to fill this big summer gap we have right here in our cool season grasses. That's what we're looking to try to do is to fill these gaps here and there in the grazing season in order to limit our amount of time that you know we're going to have to be feeding hay. Somebody here earlier, I forget who it was, was talking about feeding hay a while ago and like, well, generally we're going to start feeding hay later in the summer. 
How many of you guys have to feed hay in the summertime? Any of you? How many of you have livestock? Congratulations if you're not feeding hay in the summer. There's lots of, if you get, as I travel a fair amount and there's lots of hay get put out late in the summer. So, uh, cool season grass here is our green. The solid line is red and white clover. So see, it gives us a little more forage here in these summer months in the July, August period. And annual Lespedeza is the dotted line. Well, see, your annual Lespedeza is an annual again. You plant it in the spring, it's got to produce, make seed, and then uh, and then shed seed in the fall. So it's going to it's going to kick right in here and get a lot of growth during that summer month. You're not probably going to get quite as much production off of Lespedeza as maybe some of the other for the whole year, but it's going to give you a lot there at one point in time. Lespedeza also generally will grow on some of these poor soil types. I know we used to have pastures, and the main place we found Lespedeza was on the hillsides where we couldn't get a lot of other things to grow because they were real tolerant of some poor soils. So God made that for us in the poor, poor end of the state, I guess. Uh, something was mentioned a while ago about soil types. You know, you got dry or droughty type soils. Some can be sandy, some can be shallow to bedrock, things like that. You know, we're not all blessed as you get farther north in the state with those deeper soils. Uh, you got wet, poorly drained sites, some with higher clay content, high water table, flatter topography, it doesn't drain well. You get a combination of things. Down here we got that thing called a clay pan too, depending on where you're at and which where you're at in here. So all this makes a difference on what's going to happen. You're not going to grow much forage if that's standing in water a lot of the time. On wet sites, you can kind of look. We've got some of your, your white clovers, either the dino or alcyke, uh, orchard grass, smooth brome, perennial ryegrass. It tends to like the wetter sites a little better and more fertile soils. Naturally, got Kentucky bluegrass, fescue, and then here's our eastern gamma grass and switchgrass. They grow pretty well on these wetter soils that are just a little wetter. On a drier site, you know, uh, you're going to look at orchard grass, brome. You're going to have some of these grasses that tend to overlap as well, but some of them do a little better. Here we got alfalfa. Alfalfa, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't like wet feet, so we're going to need to, you know, be on a drier site. Red clover works well, Lespedeza. And here's our big blue stem and our eastern gamma grass. Nati our native warm season grasses, they're more deeply rooted, so they're going to they're going to work with us in, in probably some broader ranges as well. I mentioned jointed grasses. Timothy and smooth brome are probably the two of the main ones, and some of our warm season, native warm season grasses are also in that category. And uh, basically, as that plant grows and elongates, that growing point goes up that stem. We come along with the mower and cut that off at a couple inches, like Chris was talking about, then you're going to set that plant back, and it's got to pull all those energy reserves out of the carbohydrates and out of its roots in order to regrow. So that's just that much harder on that plant, where the... Uh, are what we call jointed grasses or orchard grass, and these are more like a clump grass. Why orchard grass, tall fescue, blue, Kentucky bluegrass, and perennial ryegrass, they're going to, they can be mowed a little shorter, but yet we still need to leave enough leaf area on that. And uh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I got some handouts back here if you guys want any. Ted, could you, or maybe Travis could hand out some of them. If you want to take notes, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. We was a little ahead of schedule. Uh, this might not be real readable, but it's in this chart here. It just talks about the sensitive to pH. Here's another factor we're looking at with going back to our soil testing into things. You know, if you've got good soil testing, you're going to be able to help uh, help yourself a lot here on, on picking out what forage. Naturally, six and a half to seven is alfalfa. Alpha. Here's barley, which is a crop, which can be grazed. Smooth brome. Sweet clover was talked about this morning. We don't do use it just a lot in the grazing systems anymore. Uh, a few decades ago, when I was growing up and around home, why uh, sweet clover used to be like a green manure crop. Back in those days, lots of guys plowed. Well, you'd plant you'd plant it after a wheat crop in the fall, and then you'd let that grow up and about so tall, and you'd plow it under. So we don't graze it a lot. It can be grazed. You just have to manage it. Uh, six to six five. You know, we got a pretty lengthy list of things in here, which your dino clovers, your red clover, a lot of the Timothy wheat, even be grazed or then wheat, and uh, uh, 5.5 to 6, that catches a lot more things. Your alcite clover, bird's foot trefoil, lespedeza, and uh, red top rye, sorghum, dangrass, fescue. Of course, fescue grows about everywhere, as everybody's probably aware of around here. Uh, this chart shows a little bit about seedling vigor, drought, wetness. We kind of, this is just kind of a summary of some of the things we went over, but it's a kind of handy chart because it pairs a lot of these things as we go along. Uh, 
if you're not aware of it, our cool season grasses are called C3 plants. They're in a carbon chain when you look at the chemical breakdown. I had chemistry too, but I wasn't any better than the other guys that talked earlier, so we won't dwell on that. But that's your cool season grasses. Our smooth brome, orchard grass, fescue, Timothy's in this list, I forgot to add that. And our C4 plants for our native warm seasons are big blue stem Indian grass, switchgrass, and eastern gamma. And probably our annuals would be in that as well. Uh, you can kind of see this as a pasture. Uh, got any idea what these little green spots are out here? Looks like got measles. You're right. You're right. That's just a straight grass pasture. There aren't any legumes at all out there. And uh, so ever, and it's not showing up as dark as it could be. It kind of does back here. So that's wherever the cows was grazing and they left their little manure pile, that's where it's at. Good grazing manage, management will recycle 80% of the nutrients back to the soil consumed by the animals. But unfortunately, we ain't got quite 80% of the coverage there we might have. So, but anyway. That's where the legume component comes in. Chris talked about fertility, and there may be a few slides that we overlap, but it's probably worth repeating. And uh, basically, you know, as mentioned, our legumes are able to to uh, to produce nitrogen for the grasses through the photosynthesis and then their nodules. And so, examples of these naturally are alfalfa, red clover, your other clovers, white and alcyke, ladino and alcyke. Uh, red clover is what gets used a lot out there. I'm kind of a fan of red clover. White clovers will work well. Generally, that's in more ladino varieties, and uh, they tend to work well for horses. Uh, lots of people say, well, they don't want to feed red clover to their horses, make red clover hay for their horses, or have it in their pastures. And there may be something to this fungal infection that they talk about. My oldest son worked with a guy for a guy when he was out of high school for two or three years, had horses all his life. He's passed away now, but he was probably in his 60s when he worked for him. And He's like, well, my horse has been dead 30 years ago if I hadn't red clover, ate red clover hay. He said the main problem is the seed and clover head is bitter, and that's primarily what makes them slobber a lot. Of course, if you're going out here to ride your horse every night and fool with them, you don't want the horse slobbering all over you. So, But there are uses for some of these, even if they don't work out kind of what we think. Dr. Rich Leap out of Michigan State University, uh, some of his information here on, you know, legumes are going to be more help the forages grass legume mix more productive, fix more nitrogen, increases your food your feed value in there because they're higher in crude protein, makes it more drought tolerant, get a little more uniform uh, production through the season, and it also runs a little deep, more deeply rooted than sometimes some of the grasses are. Uh, again, the nitrogen gets transferred from the uh, roots through the nodule turnover, things like that, and then as those clover plants tend to die, that just puts the rest of that tissue and the nutrients in that plant back into the soils and the, and the uh, grasses can help pick some of that up. So, you know, the nitrogen fixation will make a difference on the age of the stand as far as the, the age of the clover. How about, and the other factor that uh, is indicated also is, is the height of that clover plant is also an indication of how much nitrogen is going to fix in your soil. So if we got a lot of that little white Dutch clover, it's about four inches tall, you're not going to get too much nitrogen out of that. It's great forage if the cows or whatever can eat it, but it's not going to produce you much nitrogen. But if you've got a red clover plant that's up here, it's knee high, it's going to probably produce you quite a bit more. According to some of the studies from Kentucky and, and University of Missouri, you get anywhere from 100 to 180 or 200 pounds of uh, nitrogen back out of that. And I'd save you quite a bit on commercial fertilizer. Uh, where are we at here? Inoculants. We don't talk about that a lot. Uh, Anytime I had Robert on a program, he usually mentioned that somewhere because he always talked about fertility. And the legumes and some of these other plants as well, as forbs, need a certain type of rhizobium inoculant, and it's more specific for those type of species than others. So if we can have that and make sure that's there, then uh, when I was growing up, we always inoculated our soybeans when we planted them every year. You know, of course, a lot of beans are treated now and all that. They come treated in a bag. But when we was planting beans, you'd save beans from one year to the next. They'd buy a package of inoculant, and they'd inoculate them in a, a little flare box wagon and pour them in the planter and plant them. So times change, but some of the practices don't either. Uh, basically, you're just putting the bacteria contact next to the root of the sticking agent. and uh, But you need to make sure the inoculant bacteria is alive, because there's a date on those bags. You need to make sure that's an active date that, uh, that hasn't expired if you're going to use that too. 
Uh, if you can see this, it's two different colors. It's pretty good here. I'm not sure how well you can see it in the back. You see how much paler it is on this side. These are legumes that were not inoculated. Here's the inoculated legumes. They haven't got the picture taken where you can kind of see the plant height, but it's going to make a major difference here, as you can probably tell just from the color. So, uh, there's different forms of nitrogen, as you all know, from fertilizers. Basically, if if you're if you're greater than 30% nitrogen in legume in your grass legume component, we've always said traditionally we the the industry always says you probably don't really need much in the way of nitrogen fertilizer added. If you're going to add fertilizer, do it in split applications, about half what you're going to do in June or after the first cutting, and then come back in August or maybe the other half. That kind of gets all these forages started for stockpiling or regrowing in the fall. The conventional thinking is 30 to 80 pounds per application, and, uh, and you're going to help the grass, stimulate grass growth more than you are the legumes, but if you're not got much legume out here, that's going to help you a lot. Uh, there are different forms, and you're probably more aware of them. Ammonium nitrate, and ammonium sulfate, we can still get ammonium nitrate. You probably can't get much anymore. Once in a while, you get out of Missouri. They started making bombs out of it, and that, that took it off the market for most farmers, and even though that's the most stable thing we've got out here for nitrogen. Uh, here's recommended rates, and Kentucky bluegrass, 60 to 80 pounds. You know, if you're going to have split application, again, that's going to get you a lot more production. A year ago, I fertilized early in the spring, and then last year I thought, well, I'll just wait and make my first cutting on our hay operation. We'll cut our hay first, and then after we take the first cutting off, I'll put some put some nitrogen on. I'll figure this all out. Well, guess what? I had that spring flush come through. We baled hay. Then I put my nitrogen on, and it didn't rain after that. It didn't get me too much money, or I didn't get much out of that dollar I spent for fertilizer on that situation. But that's pretty near all your grasses. Fescue, kind of the same situation, although... Dr. Craig Roberts, University of Missouri, has done a lot of research over there, and they come out a few years ago and said, you shouldn't probably apply more than 50 units of actual N per application if you're putting it on Kentucky 31 tall fescue. That's the endophyte variety of tall fescue, because it, it can increase the endophyte level in the plant at that point. So if you get above 50 pounds on the old Kentucky 31, why, that can increase your endophyte level a little bit, and that's probably not where you want to go. Can you guys see this very well? Can you see this from the back, Cliff? Okay. This is, I did a forage clipping. I dried it all down. I calculated it all out. This is kind of looking at a stand that's 30 to 40 percent clovers and legumes with the grass, okay? Just to give you an idea of what it's going to look like. It's going to look like it's, it, it's probably more than that when you look at it if you're standing here looking at the ground because your clover plants are more dense at the top than they are at the bottom. They're going to have the single stem go down at the bottom. Their leaves are predominantly at the top. The, the grass plants are just the opposite. They're denser down at the base. Okay. Here's another. This is this is 13% legume. So you can see there's a lot less legume in here, but you're only looking at like two or three plants is all that's in this. Uh, you can barely see my little clipping frame here, which isn't important. But that's what you clip. We clip out of. It's called a clipping frame. And that size you use to calculate what dimensions you got, and you weigh it all down. Does that just give you some idea of what you're looking at when you're uh, trying to work with that? Okay, so if we're going to add legumes, I didn't talk to anybody. I don't know what it costs for red clover seed now. I plugged in three dollars. Am I close? Any of the seed guys that's here? Three dollars a pound for red clover? Is it more than that? Maybe four? What? Okay. Uh, but I did talk to FS about the nitrogen cost, and uh, so if we put in six pounds of red clover, this would be pure live seed, and uh, the uh, nitrogen cost right now from FS locally where I'm at was $350 a ton for urea. So if you put on 90 units, that's going to get you uh, cost you 34 and a quarter. That's just for the fertilizer. I don't figure out how you're going to spread it. That's on top of that. So in this study here was done back in 1978. And I adjusted the cost factors for today. Zero nitrogen, you got 3,900 pounds of, of production dry matter per year. 90 pounds, we're right at double that for $34. Put 180, which is double that, you got 9,900 pounds. Then we come down here and add red clover to our tall fescue and put on six pounds the acre for $18. Of course, that might take into the second year to get that grown if there wasn't any there the first year. They got 1,100 pounds, so you can kind of figure out the cost ratio benefit on that. So. You know, it's a pretty good investment, look to me like. 
while ago I mentioned your, your legumes can produce up to 200 pounds of nitrogen. That's coming from University of Kentucky studies and University of Missouri. There is a lag time sometimes because you got to get those plants growing if they're in short supply and whatnot. And, uh, and nitrogen fixation will be reduced or stopped if you put on nitrogen fertilizer in that situation. And then here it was saying, okay, 25% of the stand is not really significant. You're going to have to have at least 25% for the legume component to be significant in any kind of nitrogen fixation in your grasses. So, you know, just having a few plants out here isn't really going to help you very much. Deficiency, legume deficiencies, uh, there are some. They can be less hardy. There are some diseases that occur, whether it's clovers or alfalfa. Uh, they're less, especially red clovers, less perennial. It can cause, you know, be a little more instance of erosion if you just got a, a straight legume stand. We mentioned bloat potential, some fertility, because it's going to take higher fertility, and it does increase your management as well. Seed, different seeding mixtures. This is coming from the, this is our field office technical guide. Our practice is, uh, well, used, now they've updated that. Instead of pasture and hayland, now it's forage and biomass. It's still 512. On well-drained soils, here's some mixtures that would work well. These are based on pure live seed. These are similar to what's coming out of the the agronomy handbook, there's a reference to pure live seed per pound, eight pounds of alfalfa, six brome, and some bluegrass, alfalfa and red clover, kind of a mix, some orchard grass, and uh, alfalfa, orchard grass, and, and, and uh, bluegrass. And there's just a variety. This is just an example. And, uh, uh, okay, come on here. There we go. This would just be another mixture on this. This would be on for for poorly drained soils. We're going to look at bluegrass and timothy and brome. Here's some orchard grass again. Uh, fescue would come in here as well on our poorly drained soils. It'll survive fairly well. Brome doesn't do quite as well on some of that. Uh, again, we kind of mentioned earlier, Kentucky bluegrass withstands close frequent grazing. It'll stay in the stand a long time. It is lower yielding, lower drought potential. Orchard grass, it's pod forming. It does work well if you're in some shaded areas. Highly productive. Uh, a lot of the animals really prefer that. Got a soft leaf and uh, printed ryegrass is quick establishment, shorter persistent, and it's not nearly as drought tolerant either as some of our others. Smooth brome, it needs to be in a grazing rotation if it's going to stay there. It can be very productive. Uh, it's also highly digestible, probably as high if not higher than some of the other plants. Tall fescue is a very, a very uh, persistent forage. It works good in some areas where we kind of abuse it a little bit. You know, but it does have the endophyte issue in some varieties. We got the friendly endophytes out here, and I think all the companies have some of those. I'm not going to mention any names, but if you look for them, they're on the market. If you're going to plant a tall fescue, you're probably better off planting a friendly endophyte variety rather than endophyte free, in my opinion, because it'll probably stay with you longer unless you're really going to manage it very well. Uh, Timothy, it's higher quality. Uh, it's later maturing of the cool season grasses where you make hay or you graze it. But again, you're going to have to be uh, be right on top of it with the grazing rotation or it's going to get grazed out or hayed out very quickly if you don't manage it real well. Alfalfa, uh, it's highly productive, drought tolerant, doesn't work well in poor soils we talked. But it'll, it'll add a lot of production into your stand. And uh, in our hay operation last year, the alfalfa made twice the hay as anything else we had all year. But we didn't have very many acres of it, so that cut down on that. But, but uh, red clover, uh, generally it'll last a couple of years. You'll have hard seed will carry over third year. There are some, uh, oh, the Dairy Research Lab in Wisconsin, and I can't think of the forage professor's name. It's up there. He's, he's actually, I've been told, he's the only uh, forage professor in the United States working on red clover varieties. And they've got some varieties he's been working with the perfected where actually the last three years now, but still in three years they're going to have to reseed them. Fortunately, you can reseed red clover over red clover and not have any side effects. So, outside clover, it shows up generally in these wet areas, but there is some photosensitivity issues there, so you have to watch that on horses and some other animals. The dino, they've got the different varieties of that that withstands grazing a lot better. It lasts a lot longer, and uh, and it has poor drought tolerance, and it, it does tolerate wet sites fairly well also. Uh, talk about what to seed and how much. Jim Garish, he talks about you need 70 to 90 seeds per square foot with our cool season grasses and legumes. 
a lot of companies are anywhere from 200 to 300 seeds per square foot, which seems like a little overkill. You only got 144 square inches in one square foot, so you're getting a seed beyond even one per little square inch. And uh, our native grasses, they're generally clump grasses. You're not going to need near as many seeds per square foot for them. And uh, so, okay. If you don't manage your pastures and you just have one pasture, then you'll probably be looking at Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, as long as it lasts. We get a drought year, it'll take it out. Tall fescue will last quite a while, depending on what's happening there. And, uh, or some shorter variety orchard grass. Naturally, anytime I work with a producer, I'm encouraging them to try to get some kind of a, grow, like a rotation going, because that rest that you allow those plants to have will keep that uh, forage grow a lot longer. As Chris was talking earlier, there are no silver bullets. There's no one forage we can plant that's going to do everything. So you need to have a variety of things out here. Now, they all don't have to be in the same pasture. You're probably better off to have two or three grasses and a legume or two in one pasture. And if you're going to have something different, then have a different species over here. So if you've got a native warm season pasture, and it probably wouldn't be too bad an idea to have a few acres of that. Maybe 15% of your pasture operation acreage should be in that. That way, when you get these dry, hot summer periods, that's going to be at, at the peak of its production when your cool season grasses are, are not producing real well. So, but you know, you need to look at the forage that'll best complement your present forages you got. Fill gaps. That can be an annual or a perennial, either one. What meets your goals and what management level you want to put into it, you know. And uh, how how many producers here look at their forages as actually another crop? Hold your hands up. That, that's what I've been trying to tell folks for many years, and I've come to that a few years ago. If you're going to manage your forage like a crop, whether it's hay or pasture, you're going to realize more off of it. Granted, a lot of our forage acres are the poor acres on the farm, but if we put more management into it, we're going to get more management out of it. So that's just what comes down to play. And then you got to do what fits in your budget, and if you can stock it properly and just manage it more intensively, it'll work well. Uh, a little, Just a final shot here on some soil test things. So your alfalfa is going to have to, for it to stay in the stand and be productive, you're going to have to have a pretty high level of management on it and fertility. Red clover is a lot less. White clover is more forgiving. Bird's foot trefoil is kind of in the medium range. Annual espadiza, it'll get by, you know, with a lot less. Your cool season, warm season grasses, they can survive. You're just dealing with what production you're going to get on them right there. Uh, I apologize for this slide. I Pulled this off another PowerPoint, and it was the way it was. I couldn't change the font in here. That other sheet I showed you a while ago that talked about uh, that Tech Note 22, that's what they call spray, smother spray. And uh, basically, it's, it's similar to what Chris was talking about. You're going to come into an old stand here and either start in the fall or in the spring and spray that. If you start in the fall, you spray it something to kill out the old Kentucky 31 fescue. Come back in the spring if you escaped anything, hit it again, then plant a summer annual into it and either graze it or hay it off. You can come back in the fall and then hopefully there you can plant your newer variety of forages, whatever you want to replace that with at that point and you're ready and you're ready to go. Otherwise, you may have to froll over another year if you still got skips and things in here, but you're you're not losing your forage cycle in here because you're planting an annual as your cover crop. Some guys used to tear up alfalfa. Well, they still do. And plant a corn, a corn crop or some other crop after it. It's that kind of same concept, only with forages. We're just using some annual crop to either graze or make hay as we're eradicating what we don't want. And then we can come back in. And usually they're going to look at no-tilling into the what's there. Because anytime you till the soil, you're stirring up that seed bank. So in all our pastures and all our hay fields, we've got a what they call a latent seed bank. There's seeds laying here on the soil surface. Once you stir that up and you go away, something's going to grow, just like Chris was saying. You know, Mother Nature and good Lord ain't going to let us have a bare spot very long. The question is, are you going to grow what you want or what you don't want? So if we no-till when we come in here with some of these, then that'll help out. Yeah, Chris? The, the important thing to remember when you're using this method is in the spring, you do not want that tall fescue to be full of seed. So right. You have to either clip it or spray it before it goes to seed because that seed will be viable in the fall Right. Yeah, I, I should have went to this screen here. This is our tech note. You go ahead and hay it or graze it or something so it's in a fresh regrowth, probably 8 inches or 10 inches tall, about right, Chris. And then you come in and spray it and let that get burnt down and you come back and plant it. Here's your summer annual right in here. You hay it, graze it, whatever you want to do. 
you go back and spray it again. Hopefully the next time around you're killing out what's there along with any other skips or escapes from our Kentucky 31 tall fescue and then we come back and no-till into it. So we're no-tilling into what's there so we're getting minimal soil disturbance and uh, and then we get stuff to go on. Here's that cash cow that Brian had. I ain't found her yet either. Missouri, Missouri shared these uh, presentation with Brian and myself and that's where we found that cow but they haven't been very forgiving on helping us uh, find the herd. But uh, something else come to mind, I just lost it. But anyway, yeah, your fertility is an issue. We need to keep that up as well. But, but the trick is you try to, uh, to, to no-till into this when we spray it and no-till it, and it'll work fairly well. And, uh, oh, I recall, the, uh, there's information on the NRCS booth about the EQIP program, Environmental Quality Incentive, and there's a specific scenario, they call it, or cost share practice through EQIP to help offset the cost of doing this. So through the EQIP program, there there is financial assistance for that if you get picked up in the program. Yeah, Robert. Probably, you'd know more. You'd know more about that than I would. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So instead of hitting it right here, start over here, like I mentioned earlier. Hit it once there, and then you can come back. And if you haven't got many skips, maybe a quart in the spring might be enough. But if not, you have to just do according to what your chemical rep tells you to do, and then you then you're off and running. So, but anyway. Uh, somebody, Chris, somebody was talking about rest periods. Naturally, we kind of stretch them out during the summer months here. Your grasses and your legumes are in red as, as we head. Uh, we're talking about the root system and above ground biomass. All right, see this over here? That's Kentucky bluegrass. And I got to get where I close enough to read some of the rest of this. I'm sorry. Number three is Indian grass. This will be big blue stem. So you see how much more deeply these are. Oh, I got it. Oh, this is going to be about a eight foot mark right here. So big blue stems down here, pretty close to ten, and Indian grass. It takes longer to get the warm season grasses established, but that's why they're going to grow so much better during that dry, hot summer period, because their root systems are so much deeper. Okay, comparing that to alfalfa, dry land alfalfa. You know, we're looking here at. You know, here's irrigated, it's 10 foot deep, dry land, it's 9 foot deep. So either way, that's a pretty deep root system for alfalfa. But that's another reason why our alfalfa is so much more productive through the year. It's got it's much deeper root system. It's pulling those, those moisture back up where our grasses aren't, our cool season grasses aren't traditionally going to be, you get 3 foot, you're probably lucky to even get 4 foot, depending on how you manage those. But they're going to have to be managed real well to get that deep, otherwise they're going to be pretty pretty shallow. Uh, well, it's just talking about deeply rooted plants. I mean, you get improved production, better persistence, less bloat, fewer weeds, more better stand you've got as we've talked, less winter injury, more fiber in the diet, which helped with what uh, Travis was mentioned. Just different tools to improve our pasture quality. Get into grazing management has been talked about. I'm not going to dwell on it. Sometimes under some situations you can burn it, especially the warm season grass. It takes the old uh, dry material off from last year. That also gets away when you have a prairie burn in the spring. That'll kill out a lot of the little uh, woody saplings and things that are coming. That keeps them out of the stand. Autumn olive and some of these things we don't like. And uh, mechanical harvester clipping has been talked about. Fertilization, overseeding, interseeding, overseeding, other species that add in here. And generally total renovation, that's kind of the last resort because that's going to take you you're going to be down in production and it's going to cost you a lot of money to do that there. Uh, different seeding methods. Uh, this guy kind of likes to run this four-wheeler around, so if you're going to do frost seeding, normally in Illinois that's going to be the month of February. And just got a trick is to get him where he's going to drive close enough you don't have any skips here and there. Uh, a lot of people got John Deere drills. Depending on what you're going to seed, it's kind of good to have a grass seeding box up here. And uh, I planted some alfalfa this fall. 
and uh, I didn't take the time. Naturally, everything kind of went wrong that day, so the time I got the drill and got it here where I get started, it was about dark on Saturday night. So I thought, well, I wouldn't take the time to calibrate the drill. I just looked at what was in the seed box. And uh, so I just set the drill according to what was in the seed box, and I uh, had bought uncoated seed. You guys know what the difference is between coated and uncoated seed? When I'm talking about coated seed, you know what I'm talking about? They put a seed coating on it, which is supposed to help it grow better. You know how much that reduces the seed count in the bag? In a 50-pound bag, 17 pounds of what's in that bag is the coating, okay? So instead of having 50 pounds of alfalfa seed, I'm only going to get about 33. So I thought, well, I'll just plant straight seed, and I'll make this work, okay? I'm not smarter than average Joe. I'm just kind of tight. Well, I checked what the box said to set it for the rating you want to have. Well, actually, I went farther than that. I talked to the guy that was, I rented the drill from the district, and the guy said, well, if you want to plant 20 pounds, if you want 20 pounds the acre, set it right here. I'm like, okay. I did that. So I throwed it in, I started drilling, I went back there, and I was about not quite half done. I'll better check, see if I got a level of seed off. I went back there, and it was empty. Well, I had a, I had a couple bags of coated seed that I had got by mistake, and I thought, well, I'll, get the, I'll just use this other. So I put them in, and apparently the calibration that the guy told me to set was based on coated seed because it was fairly close there. So, and I took it, when I got done, another guy was waiting to use it, so I dropped it off to him, and I kind of shared my experiences with the drill setting with him, because I was only planting five acres, and he had probably 30, and this was a young feller, probably 30 years old, and I said, well, here's, here's what I got with coated seed. I said, you may want to try to figure out something if you're going to, so my 20 pounds to the acre on uncoated seed turned into 30. We ain't going to talk about the cost factor on that. And... Uh, I mean, this is true life experience, guys. And so when he printed the drill and brought it back, I said something to the guy that was managing. He goes, well, they said they planted 20 pounds the acre, but I was really surprised. He said the seeding set was way down here. Well, I haven't talked to the guy since then, so undoubtedly he listened to me. I hope he planted what he wanted or got the seeding rate he wanted, but undoubtedly he did because they just want to plant 20 pounds the acre. So, But the moral of the story is you better check the seeding rates on all these different things because coated seed and uncoated seed and and you change drills, and I'm not faulting the John Deere drill in any way. If I'd have been paying attention, I could have done what I should have done. There wouldn't have been a problem. Roger, we've got a uh, YouTube video on calibrating a grain drill. Uh, I think it's on our website. And it uses a little bit different approach than the traditional machine. You've got a table, and in that table, you pick your row spacing, and how much, how many pounds of seed you want to put out. And it tells you how much seed you have to. Mm -hmm. So it's a no mass method. It's really simple, and uh, I'd encourage you to watch that. Yeah, that'd be better. And calibrate your drill. Yeah. Because of that reason. Yeah. Well, that's why I wanted to share your, my experience with this because uh, thank goodness I was only planting five acres. I've been planting fifty. Well, I'd you generally figure out what to do like anything else when you're done, you know. And but anyway, uh, here's another brand of drills. Uh, they do these. These are used a lot on no-till situations and grass seedings and things. And for prairie grasses, they'll have these agitators in them, and uh, that makes a big difference because your your prairie grass, native warm season grass seeds are a lot fluffier and all that. Uh, Great Plains also makes drills that's, that's that's got three boxes like this one on it as well. So there's several different companies that's got them. I just happened to be at an office that had one of these. That's why I brought it in there. We haven't talked much about drought today, and I wanted to throw in one slide because. It got pretty dry last summer where I was at. So, you know, you're looking at, you know, drought provides supplement feed when your forages is basically you get grazed down to that three to four inch level. And Chris said four to five, which would probably be better because you're leaving a little more leaf area here to make for that plant to sustain itself with. Uh, start creep feeding your nursing calves. Early wean the calves, pull some of them off of them. That cow's nutrition level is going to drop a whole, needs is going to drop a whole lot more when you take the calves off of her. Rotational graze will help a lot. You know, graze some of your hay fields. And uh, last summer I had some hay, one hay field we, we didn't even bother to rake. We, actually, we didn't even bother to mow because, as my granddad used to say, well, if we mowed it, we'd have to have the rabbits gather it because there's enough there to rake up. So, you know, if you got a fence around some of these, you can graze 
some of these hay fields and still get something off of it, but yet it ain't really going to be worth your time to, to mow it, rake it, and bale it for what you're going to get off it. Separate your herd by age, body condition score. You know, if it gets bad enough, you may have to dry lot some of your cows for a while until this stuff starts growing again. So, you know, the damage you do to your, your, your pastures here when it's dry in the summer and you overgraze it, that may affect it for the next year all the way through. You never know. Uh, move stalker calves into lots. And to work, and kind of the end of it, you may have to look at reducing some of your numbers and things like that. Uh, just a summary on pastures in general. They're dynamic systems. We keep them vegetative. That's been hammered home already. Warm season grasses generally don't need quite as much fertilizer or lime. Uh, they will respond well to nitrogen, but they won't need as much phosphorus and potash traditionally, although it won't hurt to add it keep them in there. Stockpile forage is the cheapest for wet and best for winter feed. Legumes add nutrition quality as well as you know, help you with the fertility, and uh, also they add quite a bit in, in fertility costs. So, uh, some of my contributors and different sources here. There's the uh, required statements on anything we do at NRCS, and uh, I guess it's where we go from here. If you got any questions? I'll try to take them. Otherwise, it'll be wrapped up. I think. Yeah, I live in Greenville on I seventy right up here. Well, generally, well, when I work with a producer, uh, generally I recommend starting out, if you got one or two pastures, I would say you need to start out with five pastures. And a very sharp guy pointed this out to me 20 years ago, and he's sitting on that back row right there, the blue cap on, Tom Sachs. And, uh, well, he, he knows his cattle, and he knows a lot about grazing fescue, too, because that's what he's got on his farm. But the issue is, if you got one or two pastures, and I come in and tell you, well, you need 12 or 15 or 20 pastures, you're not really going to be, you know, if you whether you farm or you got an off-farm job, that's a lot of a lot of that's a big leap for you to take right up front. You divide that into five pastures, you can rotate the cows once a week. That's going to give you right at 28 days rest from pasture one to when you come back to pasture one on the other end, and you're going to see a pretty good benefit from that. Now, if you can get the water placed here and there where, and Chris had a shot in there about water points where to divide things, if you get some water points that will work on five pastures, and you get comfortable with that, and you kind of see, okay, here's, here's how much more forage production, how much more dynamic my forage system is going to be because it's got a rest period. The more rest that forage gets, the more it's going to grow, but you will have to keep it vegetative for that to do that, okay? But you get into five pastures and you get your water points placed out here, You'll figure out pretty quick how you can probably divide that into 10 if you want to rotate every three or four days instead of once a week if you have the time. And several years ago, and I can't tell you how many, University of Kentucky did an economic study, and they said for a cow-calf operator, if you have about 12 pastures, that's probably economically where you're going to get the most return versus what you're going to spend to go much beyond that. Now, if you're a stalker operator, you probably ought to, you'll probably want to rotate your animals maybe every couple days because you want to keep that nutrition plane up here about so high as them, them calves move through, because you're trying to get that two pound a day gain or more on them. The old cows are going to be able to fluctuate with that, and that's going to affect them that much. But I'd say start out with five pastures, and but wherever you're at, you need to have more than one pasture. And, and There you go. Yep. Everywhere in southern Illinois, the old Kentucky 31 tall fescue is a big part of it. Now, fescue is predominant pretty much clear up into Bloomington, and some of the folks tell me, well, it's not as predominant up on the Wisconsin border. We do a pasture land natural resource inventory thing that I've helped with up there part of the time, and it's not as prevalent when you get on that north corridor, lyric corridor row of counties in Wisconsin it is down here. But tall fescue is still there. Now, they've got more brome grass. You know, you look in the road ditch, you're going to know what's going on. You know, used to be we got Springfield North, you'd have mostly smooth brome in your road ditches. 
and it's still there, but you're starting to see more fescue. It's kind of creeping its way north. But, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to put some kind of grass. A lot of sunshine now, open the clear. What would be the best thing as far as grass? I just want to graze. I don't want some for you know real low. I don't even want to start taking that. I don't want to sow the soil. What can I do to put some kind of grass in there like a good one How are you gonna plant it? Cross seed it? Well, I would say probably go in with a friendly end to fight fescue and orchard grass and add some clovers into it. And and then probably the best time to, well, it may take a couple different temps because of the weather because you can't do it, you can't no-till it, so you're just at the mercy of freezing and thawing. Our, fe our month of February is best for frost seeding for like the legumes. I've heard some guys talk about... Uh, about uh, waiting to get a little later in the spring for some of the grasses, so still freezing a little at night. You can try it right away if you ain't already, have you already seeded anything yet at all. No, I, wasn't gonna do anything here. I I would say try to put some orchard grass and some friendly endophyte fescue, although that's fairly expensive and it's pretty expensive seed to scatter on top right now. You could add some timothy in it; that might work fairly well. It's small round seed. You wouldn't probably be able to blend all that. You may have to. I don't. Well, you got a four wheeler or something else to use. Rather than walking up by hand, I don't know how many acres you're doing here, but uh, yeah, you know, you just and and bouncing over a few stumps with the four wheeler is just going to scatter the seed a little more probably. But I I would probably look at in your environment probably a fescue and orchard grass and some timothy and then add some kind of some kind of clover legume, whether ladino or red clover. Yeah. You might want to you might want to add some le some uh, lespedes in there as well, because it's probably going to be a lower pH in that timbered area. Because generally we tend to have more acid soils down here, and the leaves that's falling off of that and everything going to make that soil a little more acidy. So add some kind of clover with it, and then probably add uh, add a little lespedes in it. It might take quicker than the clover, and if you let that lespedes go to seed, it'll come back next year. But it's got to make seed to do that. And uh, that's probably what I'd shoot for in your situation. That'd be a good idea. That'd be a good idea. Yeah, you might want to just pull soil samples because, like Robert's saying, if your pH is that low, you might just not even want to put any. You might use some ladino clover; it might be tolerant. That and lespedeza, but I'd go stronger on the lespedeza on the other because, like he's saying, you know. And if you get just spread some lime on top, even though you're not going to till it, I wouldn't put more than two ton of lime per acre on in most situations, even if you have the opportunity to till it a little bit because the soil is only going to break down so much of that so fast. According to, according to the microbes and what's going, you know, the organic matter in the soil. Like Chris had that one slide, the fungi and everything. They can only process so much so fast. So you know, probably two ton of lime would be as much you'd put on. In that case, you might only put one ton on. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand what you're saying. I mean, yeah. If you got, well, that could work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I wouldn't put more than two ton of lime on because it, it's not, it's going to take a certain amount of time, even if you can light disc what you can get to. Uh, they got pelleted lime fertilizer, but that's pretty expensive, so you wouldn't want to put more than 100 or two pounds of that on. If you can get the regular lime on, that'd probably be cheaper and just give it more time. And like Robert said, you're, you know, it's been timber a long time, your, your fertility level is going to be pretty low. Your, your grasses are going to be more tolerant than your legumes, but if you use some Lespedes in it, like I said, that'll be more tolerant of lower pH, and I think Ladino clover is more tolerant of lower pH than the other varieties. So, What's that? They probably won't eat it if they don't like it, unless you're starving them to it. Unless you got a pretty good fence, you ain't going to starve a goat to anything. They're going to eat all them saplings that Chris was telling you about first, and they'll they're top feeders, like Dean was Dean was saying a while ago. So they're going to eat the grasses or anything that's on top. So anyway, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Phosphorus, yeah. Uh, what's the best uh, all around? I mean, I'm talking about economical. I mean, it has to tell you everything they got. What's the best? What's the best stock in the book? What's the best stock in the book? My Depends on what you're needing. Yeah, I know you're going to tell me what kind of. I, I I would I would say if you haven't put much fertilizer on, you probably better put some potash on first. Robert, you got to probably can answer that better than I could. Right. 